I think cognitive biases are key in this. People might know this is the right thing to do. They might know their role and still sit back and you know switch the channel. <laughs> okay, yes, yes, we agree and we have to do it. And then it, someone will do it for us. So, um, so I think the, the realization of the place we're in in the world and the fact that because tomorrow looks the same as today doesn't mean that things are not changing. We've seen it with COVID-19, exponential uh, change works in interesting ways. So um, hopefully there will be a realization that we're at a stage where all our economic valuation processes do not work when one of the variables is human extinction. Dr. Yusuf Nassif is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Yusuf started the work on adaptation to climate change in the United Nations system and has led the adaptation work streams under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change since their inception. He possesses 30 years of experience in diplomacy and international environmental policy and is the seconded diplomat from the Egyptian Foreign Services. While assuming progressively higher levels of leadership at the UNFCCC, he led UNFCCC support for a number of ongoing initiatives on adaptation. These include the inception and support for NAPAs and NAPS, the national, the Nairobi Work Program, an international knowledge hub for impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation, and the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. He recently created the Resilience Frontiers Initiative, which applies foresight for attaining post-2030 resilience. He regularly contributes his vision, insights, and thought leadership to international conferences on resilience and adaptation to climate change and their nexus with sustainable development, often focusing on developing countries. He holds a doctoral degree in international technology policy and management and a master's degree in international environmental policy from the Fletcher School of Law and diplomacy, as well as master's degree in Middle East studies and bachelor's degree in computer science and physics from the American University in Cairo. Welcome to the podcast, Yusuf. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. It'll be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm glad you could take time out of your busy schedule. This is a crazy time leading up to... to uh, COP26 in Glasgow, and you've got tons of other reports and initiatives and things you're working on, so you're very busy full-time. Matter of fact, you've been so kind. Today's your day off. It's a holiday in Germany and in Bonn, where you're at at the UN, and you, you decided to go into the office to help me out to do the podcast, and I really appreciate it. Just for my listeners, I want them to know that we know each other. That's why I'm using your, your first name basis. Um, uh, for the rest of them, it's uh, Dr. Nassif, but I, I, you're such a personable uh, um, man that I'm sure that once you get to know people, you, you quickly uh, befriend them. We know each other through Clarabelle Pajol, who is also at the UNF C, and she introduced us because of a book, uh, Moonshots for Europe, and, and uh, that led to many other things where we ended up going to Songdo, Korea, to the NAP Expo, and uh, doing a five-day intensive foresight workshop with Future Literacy Labs, UNESCO, and many other things, and that's kind of uh, how we know each other and uh, have built a nice friendship and relationship ever since, and I really appreciate that and thank you for that so much uh, and giving me uh, deeper insights into the UN and to all fabulous work you're doing. Thank you, Mark. Yes, it's been quite a journey and I think um, the interface with people like yourself, futurists, um, people who are passionate about the SDGs but not thinking in the here and now but looking into the future has been something we were really missing in 
the normal UN day-to-day -day work. So I think this has opened up a really interesting uh, portal for us. And, and like you say, it, it's, it's a mutual benefit. And, and the thought process that went through this, as you mentioned in Songdo and thereafter, has very much enriched our work. So, so thank you for that. You're, you're most welcome. It's been a sheer pleasure. And there were so many other uh, friendships and new uh, acquaintances that I met through that experience that have just, just enriched my life. Um, I've already in the beginning thrown out some acronyms or some terms that most probably not everyone is, is uh, aware of. The United Nations Framework for Climate Change Conference or uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's our basic framework change. convention on climate change. Uh, that's the UNFCCC. The NAP Expo is, stands for National Adaptation Plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where a lot of your work for uh, since the beginning has a, a been, which is a mechanism known as National Adaptation Plans that um, is basically involving developing countries, large group of countries that have submitted these plans uh, and will be submitting more plans to, to COP26 uh, uh, and presenting some reports. And hopefully there'll be a lot of objectives and, and things reached out of that. Um, trying to think if there was another, um, the COP is a conference of the parties and there's, you know, the most famous one is COP21. So we will throw out some of those terms and hopefully I will be able to keep everybody up to speed of what those acronyms and and those terms are, and if not, we'll list them in the show notes and descriptions. You've been doing this for quite some time, so you've been concerned about climate change and human suffering and environmentalism, the UN uh, hu human rights frameworks. Uh, you've been in this space for a long time, talking about it, working on actions, trying to bring countries together to agree on a roadmap forward to, to improve better things. And then in 2020, all sorts of craziness broke out. Not only the whole world was affected by the pan pandemic and COVID, and we had you know uh, craziness with an inauguration. We had Black Lives Matters. We had a lot of issues around people of color. We had uh, just recently uh, Asian violence and, and uh, racism things happened there. So our, our world's kind of, in turmoil, it's uh, crazy things are going on, but I want to know all these years of working and uh, for the UN being involved with us, seeing many different cultures and and dealing with delegates and diplomats, has any of that given you a little bit more resilience to weather this crazy time or storm? Maybe even a better operating system for life so that the rest of us can get through these times uh, a little bit better. Um, yeah, well, thank you for that question. I think um, the era we're living in, this, this COVID era, has, um, has brought to fore a lot of interesting things. Um, you're confronted with a phenomenon you, that's fraught with uncertainty. You don't know when it will end. You don't know whether new variants will come up and how, how dangerous they will be. And it's a bit similar to the climate change narrative. So um, a couple of decades ago, yeah, we knew it was a problem. You know, you could you could replicate the greenhouse effect in a lab, knowing that increased concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere would lead to increased temperatures. But we don't exactly know how the effects would be distributed. Um, there are probabilities. There's high confidence, low confidence. But it's such a wicked problem, um, and how to react to it. Now with COVID, it's it's very similar. There's a lot of uncertainty. However. It, it reminds you of that question of the frog being thrown in the boiling water. When it's thrown in the boiling water, it jumps out immediately. This is what happened with COVID-19. Despite the uncertainties, despite everything, you see the impact right away. And immediately the investments come in. Everyone is researching how to respond to it. People are wearing masks, et cetera. Now, climate change is a longer term problem, which means that in terms of the perception of, of any human being on the street, today looks very similar to yesterday and very similar to tomorrow. There's no exponential um, increase in perception of the problem. And, and then that's why cognitive biases kick in. And you see how, yes, we're taking our time. Yes, it's a problem. We hope someone else will do it, you know, the bystander effect, et cetera. 
And this is what, what we've been thinking of. How do we transfer that passion that we've seen in responding to COVID to longer term problems that could be equally or even more impactful to our lives? I mean, climate change is an existential problem. If left to proceed without, without any intervention, then humanity itself uh, is at risk of disappearing. And, um, and so this is, this is one of the things that one thinks of. On the other hand, um, it is a global problem where the world is not, is not very well equipped to handling global problems. Um, we are divided into nations, nation states, and the primary responsibility of a government is to service its, its population. And so elevating the discourse to be a global discourse um, to respond to something that does not respect national boundaries injects a lot of complexity in how we deal with this because we don't have a global negotiation system. We have an international negotiation system. So still we're divided into countries and um, we operate on consensus. We create international law, but all countries have to agree um, or at least no country can object. There's a slight difference in, 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 in nuance with, between unanimity and consensus. So consensus means that any decision we make does not receive uh, an explicit object, objection. And to get 200 countries to agree to anything is a miracle. And that's why people feel that, oh, we're too slow. You know, you've been doing this for 20 years. What has happened? Um, but um, on the one hand, yes, it is slow because you need everybody on board. It's not like a simple majority and you can move forward because it's global, everyone has to be on board. Um, but on the other hand, a lot has happened. I mean, the, the, the process, the negotiations process and the science, the advances in the science and the signal to, to the private sector and R&D that has gone into renewables, et cetera, all of this has led to the transformation we're seeing now. There has been a system of incentives and disincentives from increased awareness and political commitment to solving the climate change problem, which emerged from the process of negotiation. That is leading to the direction that we're on now with new technologies, with new opportunities, and eventually a net zero um, objective that, that we have to reach in order to stem the problem of climate change. That, that was the best explanation that, that I've received so far, and I really appreciate those um, examples and those analogies for our listeners to really kind of un understand that the, the bigger picture and how what that journey has looked like and, and also how extremely complex it is. Under the U UNF uh, C, uh, you're part of the secretariat and... Um, uh, the leadership in the secretariat. And uh, I guess within that structure, there's Patricia Espinoza, who's the executive secretary. Uh, she took over for um, Christiana Figueres, and uh, who is also the, the cop queen. Now, Patricia Espinoza is the cop queen, I guess, the conference of the party. Um, and then there's uh, you as director of adaptation, Ova uh, Sarmad is deputy executive secretary. Um, and we've had different events around food and, and different meetings um, in Bonn at the pre-cops and things. But you're surrounded by these fabulous leaders, these fabulous people who are really pushing the envelope forward on trying to bring these countries and these delegates uh, together and uh, diplomats and hopefully diplomatic people, people who are diplomatic and willing to agree and come together quicker than not. But even more on, on a little bit personal level. So your work out of the Bonn office, the, the UN has a, a headquarters in New York, uh, uh, the, the COP uh, or headquarters, I guess, are in in Bonn or the UNF Triple C is headquartered in Bonn, um, who does the climate conferences. And then there's an office in Geneva and it's kind of spread spread around the world and it's very complex, many inner agencies and organizations um, where their preparations already in place or type of operating structures that the UN itself was able to say, you know, we've been preparing for climate. We've also, through the WHO, been preparing for other things. 
that we're able to, uh, we knew this was coming and now we have these operating systems in place that are kind of better models because we're supposed to bring those countries together that kind of have us as an essential workers to, to weather the storm or to help to, for, for relief and different things. I guess I, I just want to, before we move on, touch upon, upon that aspect of it. So I'm sure the UN wasn't, uh, was also hit and, and suffered some, some severe uh, issues and things, but are there places or models in place already uh, that are just a better operating system to get us through these hard times, things that we can apply and do. Uh, I don't know if you understand what I'm, where I'm trying to go. I, I was just saying, like, ha, has the UN applied some of these negotiations or some of the things they're trying to get countries to, to do or that the interagencies are do on themselves? And now that we're in this time of extreme crisis of a pandemic that We've got some models in place that can kind of let us work through it and get not not back to usual, but to to keep life going instead of just feeling like this big pause forever. Yeah, I think there there are two uh, two answers to that question. So in terms of um, of trying to practice what we preach, um, we certainly do that. So all our our operations, including the annual session of the conference of the parties are um, um, are offset. So we offset all the emissions. We make sure in our daily lives that we minimize as much as possible any activities that lead to, um, to waste in resources. We're mostly paper-free. We uh, try to rely um, on uh, online meetings as much as possible, not just during the pandemic, but generally, and we will not stop. I think now we'll do it even more once we get back to normal because we've there's so many more platforms and, and better functionality. So, um, so in that sense, we do. And on the other hand, we also produce uh, the methodological uh, basis upon which countries can have a comparable platform from which to assess where it is in, in, in its climate change action and help with the reporting process, et cetera. But on the other hand, I think you've, you've touched on something. You, you may recall my, my first answer where the world is divided into nation states. So we have an international system, but also the UN is divided into thematic organizations. Um, I'm not saying they're silos because we have built um, uh, interagency collaboration and climate change permeates everywhere but countries have ministries and specific ministries interact with specific UN agencies. So you have an existing system and you wonder if we're trying to solve tomorrow's problems with yesterday's tools or yesterday's institutional setup, etc. So as we move into, into foresight thinking, um, one looks ahead as to how can we best um, make that transformation either adjust our existing modalities and systems to be optimized for what is needed as we move into the future um, in reaching the SDGs and post SDGs, retaining them or improving on them. Um, and also on um, what, what the needed transformation or the paradigm shift um, entails in terms of our own setup and how we conduct negotiations and how um, how we conduct our own organizational work. And, and there are people working, uh, there's several projects around the world looking at the implications of um, virtual work on the future of climate diplomacy. So they are looking at certain cliches of our process, certain elements of it that were shaped that way because of physical presence the way observers engage in the negotiations, the way we crowdsource inputs, et cetera, and saying now, you know, maybe in a virtual world, we don't have these constraints anymore. So why are we just trying to replicate the, the physical onto the virtual without rethinking the, the fundamentals? And, um, and I mean, this is a story that always happens with any paradigm shift, whether it's the information technology revolution or before that, the industrial revolution. So I think the coming 10 years will see a lot of change and the question is whether the change will happen to us as an exogenous um, variable or whether we happen to the change and try to design it in a way that then ends us up with that best version of humanity that we want to see post 2030. 
I love that. And uh, I guess this would be probably the best time to tickle also going into uh, resilience frontier. So everybody knows about the sustainable development goals. And matter of fact, I had um, Felix Dodds on, on the show, on the podcast, and he did negotiating the sustainable development goals, uh, wrote this book. But it really kind of was a culmination out of a couple events, a Stockholm meeting, as well as uh, um, the, uh, I believe it was Rio plus 20, and then this this side meeting for Bogota, uh, Colombia, that they had over a long time where this sustainable development was talked about, but then it slowly moved and was developed into something. Resilience Frontier is now post 2030, obviously, um, and it's uh, the Resilience Frontier around pioneering emerging technologies, old indigenous wisdoms. There's three main pillars and, and eight um, objectives, so three objectives and eight, um, how, how to, what's the right term, pathways, eight pathways that we have in this. And it, it was uh, some pre meetings before Songdo Korea with uh, Future Literacy Labs, UNESCO, Real Miller with the, the UNFCCC staff and uh, um, Future IO Institute and, and, and many other uh, thought leaders, futurists, uh, environmentalists, activists, people who really, really know and, and are there. And then we were all invited to do this really kind of a moonshot work shop in Songdo, Korea to come up with some hard hitting discussions. And you invited a who's who of guest list to that event. Uh, one who was sitting at my table that I was uh, facilitating and taking part of was Hindu Abraham Omar, uh, Omar Ibrahim, who is a sustainable development goal advocate as well. She's a beautiful person, represents all indigenous populations. And it was just a fabulous, well put on event. Lots of documents, lots of recording, lots of iterations of this moonshot canvas and, and things. But I, I, I'm just tickling it. I would like more your synopsis, what led to that. And, and maybe could you answer, do we have the maybe tickling of, of, a, of an option or possibility that it could evolve into something more from 2030 to 2050, some resilience development goals or something like that? Um, well, thanks, uh, Mark. I mean, this, is, um, this is a project I'm, um, I'm really fascinated by. And um, perhaps the, the original motivation for trying to tackle this, uh, this exercise, which is intended to identify how do you move towards permanent resilience post-2030, was, um, was the realization that there's a mismatch of, of pace, of, um, of the evolution of our problems, versus our capacity to handle them. Um, so you're seeing the SDGs. So the SDGs intend to tackle 2015's problems by 2030. Now between 2015 and 2030, are we looking at new problems that are coming up and preventing them from happening or uh, doing that systemic shift in our, in our activities that can, um, can uh, uh, lead to um, a fundamental fix in the main ailment that is pro keeps producing these things all the way from uh, acid rain in the 70s to COVID-19 now passing through the ozone hole and climate change and um, uh, species uh, extinction, um, uh, everything else that, that, that we've experienced over the past few decades. And the idea there is that we keep, we seem to be plugging holes all the time. And then, you know, come 2030, we will say, oops, you know, there's all these new inequities because, you know, of um, AI benefiting some people and not others. Let's have a new set of SDGs. So a, a third wave to solve this by 2045. First, we had the MDGs, obviously, and then SDGs, and then who knows what's coming next. So something was wrong um, in, in that paradigm. And it's a matter of pace. We take a long time to be able to adjust institutions, to put in place resources, et cetera. So I thought, let's, let's start a, a different way of thinking. And... Uh, closer to home, basically, in, in climate change, 
we've seen um, the Paris Agreement had a certain rhythm associated with it. So our first political moment was intended to be in 2023. At that point, we have something called the global stock take, where countries give themselves a report card. How well are we doing? Are we close to achieving our objectives of um, you know, uh, stemming uh, global warming at 1.5 degrees or, or not? And um, then, so the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015. 2018 and 2019, the science came out and gave us a different narrative. So first the IPCC and then uh, IBES, which is the Biodiversity um, uh, Intergovernmental Platform. And both were consistent in saying that we need a transformative shift in how we do things and it has to be done in the coming few years. Now, negotiating processes heard this um, and continued with our same paradigm and rhythm with the hope that by having this um, sort of voluntary setup that we have, it's a pledge and review system, that we would reach the, the necessary outcome. But I was seeing that, okay, uh, we might do that uh, if, if we treat climate change as the problem, but what if we look at it as the symptom? Just like acid rain may have been, just like uh, ozone, it's like COVID-19, and who knows what else might come. Can we, can we look at the fundamentals that keep producing this in terms of our behavior, in terms of economic activity, in terms of our values, how we value certain things in terms of inequalities, et cetera. It's very close to the thinking that led to the SDGs, but then not intended to have that rigid deadline by 2030, but, but look at it beyond that. And at the same time, I'm looking around me and, and you know we're looking at plastics in the ocean and the littering and let's fix it and whatever. And everyone is intent on doing that and technologies are being created. But hey, aren't we doing the same to space? Aren't we littering space now with tens of thousands of little satellites? Some, uh, some have a mechanism for, 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 for degradation, but some don't. And what will happen then? Will we come to 2030 and say, oops, now we've fixed the ocean, let's fix space and whatever else that we're doing. Or yes, we fixed you know, um, inequality by its old definition, but now we have all these techno haves and techno have nots because of all these new, um, new technologies and, and prosy that have come out. So I thought, okay, if, if humanity is going to fix itself, which it should, because now for the first time in history, we are facing first the Anthropocene, which is where, um, um, uh, humans have for the first time in history had a discernible impact on their own surrounding environment. But second, we have that risk of, of extinction, um, which uh, I think humans, uh, and it's the extinction due to our own actions. What other species does that to itself? Um, so so I, I it's saw- that It's really that Band-Aid that you were talking about. We're just continuing to put Band-Aids on a much bigger problem. But then all the foresight exercises I had, I had seen before were focused on specific areas. And I thought, okay, let's have a holistic um, encounter. And you may recall uh, when you participated, you gave an amazing um, a keynote uh, presentation that everyone appreciated there because it gave us that view of the earth holistically from sort of an outsider's perspective. I love that. Um, and we had, we had their people from three clusters, one, the drivers of change. So all the technologies, you know, AI, blockchain, uh, autonomous systems, biotechnology, satellites, et cetera. Then we had basic needs. So regardless of what systems are in place or what the world look like, looks like, you need food and water and health and um, um, uh, nature and security. And then we had a look at institutional setups, which are then the variable there, which is, how you set up financial systems, education, um, uh, regulations, laws and governance, and uh, arranging habitats, et cetera. And bringing all these people together and using those methodologies from both UNESCO and from Future IO in a merged setup was something that had never been done before. And, and it, it resulted in a very objective process that is traceable. So it's not just we, we ended with the usual shopping list just because that was the consensus of people there. Everyone could trace back how we got to those eight pathways. And the eight pathways are those visions in different areas, which if implemented, you can guarantee that the world will become 
a per permanently a better place. So it dispenses with that notion of plugging holes. And that, that's the beauty of that exercise. We got these 115 um, knowledge uh, leaders who, and I, I don't know if you know this, not many people know how they were selected. Each person who was invited to be part of, um, of the, these expert groups had to cover expertise in two different areas that had to be from different clusters. So an AI person that was also a water person. So the interdisciplinarity was built in into the selection process of, of, the, of the experts that were there. The first couple of days um, were to, to move their brain to another place. So it's not just that they're coming to give the expertise they have. No, it, it was elevated beyond that, that they're supposed to engage in collective intelligence and together create new insights and new knowledge. And I think in the end, we had, we had very clear um, agreement on, 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 um, on, on these outcomes. Now we have these eight pathways converted into storylines, which is what would the world look if this was fulfilled? And if not, so there's a utopian and a dystopian um, uh, na narrative. And when you read those, the dystopian is not if things go wrong, it's if things continue as they are. I mean, that's the sad part. <laughs> The default is the dystopian, and it's very scary. It's almost like, you know, back to the future when you saw how bad the world could be. It, it, it's, it's very similar to that. And uh, the next step is what we call the road mapping phase, where um, there will be eight groups, one for each pathway, and they will um, um, engage in a methodology that is supposed to prioritize the seed actions, the topmost uh, activities that could spur um, through a flywheel effect more actions to take place to reach the, the end uh, vision. So it's not that we're looking for uh, the usual things, the most efficient, the most effective, the most sustainable, no. It's what should the first mover be. It could, it's like something like Rosa Parks being on that bus. That was the first move. It wasn't about campaigns or investments or this. So black swan events that are planned and predictable, we call them blue swans. And so how do you do that? There's a methodology group thinking about that right now uh, in order for the, um, um, the pathway groups to be able to, 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 to follow that uh, sort of innovative way of finding um, and predicting those blue swans. There's another group right now looking at um, a cutting edge, uh, communication um, action for behavioral change. So we have people from, from media, from show business, from neurobiology, from marketing all together. They've, these disciplines have never talked to each other before. So um, they, they gather once a month and trying to get some insight out of them to feed into that road mapping process. And the end result is yes, you'd get a list of things. Here's the stuff that if you do, we guarantee that it would lead to this. It's not just proposals that will help, but this is very deterministic and we can trace back the logic. And so that point will be where we would need um, the people who can take action to then say, okay, you know, I'll adopt this and I will make sure that this action is undertaken. I will invest in it. So um, people who are into, into um, social entrepreneurship will be really important in moving this forward because um, it will be the first time they see the list of actions produced through a rigorous scientific process, not by consensus of experts, which could work or not. And so, so that's, that's where we are. It's um, the, 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 the thing that makes it special is its holism. It covers all aspects of, of the transformation towards a resilient world, not just resilient to climate change, but resilience to anything that will keep producing these things that eventually come back to harm us. And, um, it's also um, a process that creates that tomorrow's thinking <laughs> uh, to be able to solve tomorrow's problems. Um, having said that, I have to emphasize that it's not a problem solving exercise. We're not trying to plug holes again by saying we have a problem of this and this and this, now how will we solve it? No, it's a problem of co-creation of a new paradigm. Hopefully that will render today's problems obsolete anyway. I mean, I always remind people when they say, oh, but today's systems are bad, we need to change them. I say, go back 
three decades ago. I mean, did, did, did Apple computers set out to destroy IBM actively? No. I mean, they set out to be the paradigm shifter. They were a tiny company. No one would have seen them as the bright light of the time. But I mean, IBM got out of the PC business as a result eventually, not because anyone targeted them, but because the world shifted to a different state in which the old system became obsolete. When automobiles came, they did not actively try to sabotage horse-driven carriages. They just took over and people had a preference to do, moving to the new system. Here it's more complex because we're talking about worldviews, we're talking about values, and communication is essential in this story. And the whole notion of, um, I, I think cognitive biases are key in this. People might know this is the right thing to do. They might know their role and still sit back and you know switch the channel. <laughs> Okay, yes, yes, we agree and we have to do it and then it, someone will do it for us. So, um, so I think the, the realization of the place we're in in the world and the fact that because tomorrow looks the same as today doesn't mean that things are not changing. We've seen it with COVID-19, exponential uh, change works in interesting ways. So um, hopefully there will be a realization that we're at a stage where all our economic valuation processes do not work when one of the variables is human extinction. I mean, you know how cost-benefit analysis works. You have a discount rate. It's not about inflation. It's the time value of money. And it goes totally contrary to the principle of intergenerational equity. So on the one hand, we're saying, yes, we want sustainability, which is about future generations having the same opportunities as coming generations. And at the same time, all the business schools and economic schools are telling people, no, you do not do that. Today's dollar is more important than tomorrow's. So if you can make a million today while losing 10 million, while imposing a loss of 10 millions on your kids, you choose the million today. And there are fundamental problems of thought, including academic thought, that have to be transformed in order for us to shift to that, to that new um, to that new world. We are close to the end of the viability of the current, current ways of thought and of teaching and of learning to solve these problems and to transform us to where we need to be. So we're constrained by things that we don't need to be constrained by really. I mean, there's, so a lot of changes need to happen and learning is part of, of the resilience frontiers pathways as well. So it, it is holistic, like I said. That's so beautiful, and you uh, explain it so nicely so that we get this nice broad overview as well as where it's going. You know, the sustainable development goals and sustainable development in, in general is not just a, another add-on to business as usual. It's an entirely new operating system, but at the core, it's set out to be a, a solid infrastructure, a sustainable infrastructure for humanity. It doesn't matter how sustainable that infrastructure is if climate catastrophe pandemics things like that occur um that sustainability can be wiped out in one day the, the you know and you you kind of address this the reason of resilience is we need to be able to have food water basic infrastructural needs tomorrow after those events occur and so we really need to build this resilience into the system and so it's perfect um, the, the way this has been set up with objectives the pathways now doing the science of the the blue swan because uh, I, I, I was there and we were talking about desirable futures uh, uh, probable futures uh, practical futures you know and we were talking about the third horizons and the, the different dimensions not only the future literacy, foresight, backcasting. We're going into all the different ways to not only shift the way of our thinking, but to expand it out well into the future. What do we need to have that resilience there? And, and there are some different models of, of resilience. There's a very dystopian resilience, one where we're all running around in spacesuits and gas masks or even face masks and, and social distancing, uh, uh, but that's a very dystopian resilience. We're still surviving, but it's not enjoyable for anybody overall. Then there's that really that resilience where it's desirable, where we can still enjoy food and water and air and nature and, and each other. And, and still, even though we're facing hard environmental times, still 
um, have food and the basic necessities, that infrastructure that is continuing to operate as if we are on this spaceship Earth or this closed system, which we are. Or there's that, you know, the other resilience of it's more psychological and mental where if somebody swears at you or hits you or, or does something wrong that you have the mental or physical capacity to bounce back with a little resilience instead of being permanently disabled or, or dying from that situation. So we really need to understand what, what is that resilience that we want and everyone at at the meeting and everyone that you're talking about really that uh, that i see in here is is the the kind i guess utopian resilience is is the wrong word the desirable resilience is where it comes out and so I, I like that you address that and the other thing that I, I really liked is you mentioned the blue swan so we're going to have a meeting here on the 25th of May with Future IO as well, um, where John Elkington, he just wrote a book not too long ago called Green Swans. And so for those of you um, out there who might not know, a lot of us have heard about the black swans, but we didn't know that there's also ugly ducklings, there's gray swans, there's black swans with green wings, there's green swans with black wings. And there, yes, there is blue swans as well. And that's a, a form of where, where are we going? What, what are the operating systems? What are the models that are resilient, not just for humanity, but for our whole biodiversity, our whole world? And those are truly the, the science, the facts and the topics, the way we try to frame that and what you guys are working on. It's still a work in progress. Um, so I, I really appreciated you sharing that with us, but I'm sure you have something else you'd like to add. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, there's a couple of conceptual um, fallacies that we have to address. I mean, some people know about the fallacy of composition and the fallacy of division, where, uh, I mean, you know the joke, why do, uh, um, why do white sheep eat more than black sheep? And the answer is because there's more of them. Um, and so when you're talking about uh, the components, sometimes um, when you talk about the, the group that encompasses the components, these attributes don't apply both ways. So we talk about global resilience. It's not necessarily the aggregation of the resilience of individual humans or individual countries. That I think is being taken care of by our own policies, but no one is speaking for the globe as a whole. And the globe will survive. It has built-in mechanisms to get rid of us and continue as it is. But um, when we talk about permanent resilience, just for absence of a better word, word we mean the capacity of, um, of, of planet Earth to continue sustaining humanity, which is very different from the well-being of planet Earth. That, that's not, we, we don't have the power to influence that. We only have the power to influence our, our own capacity to be hosted <laughs> by, by planet Earth. And that is different from resilience in the context of policy, where we talk about individuals, communities, cities, countries being able to withstand external shocks and either bouncing back or using it as an opportunity to get to another developmental stage, that, that's, that's okay. But the thinking of the earth's natural um, hospitability to humanity does not have um, a home in, in the discourse. And that's really what, what we're talking about. Eventually it reflects back on, on our own resilience because if the, the natural support system is no longer willing to accommodate us, then it doesn't matter if we can withstand a, a flood or a drought, you know, we, we, we just get out of there. Now, the other thing um, is the notion of um, futurists and foresight experts engaging in trying to predict the future and saying, okay, the future is uncertain and here's how we can adjust to it. What we're trying to do is something totally different we know that the future is a function of our actions. It's not exogenous. So let's not look into trying to predict, and yeah, if this happens, we'll be ready because of this. No, we can actually create it. So let us, uh, and, and there is an old saying, I mean, it was said by many different people, so the attribution is unclear, 
that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Abraham Lincoln wrote it, several people said it. And, um, and so um, the, um, the difference from um, what is generally considered futures literacy, futures literacy looks at your capacity to anticipate and to respond to an unknown future. Um, FLL, the, the moonshots, you know where you want to go and here is, you know, here are the steps you can design to go there. So we try to merge these. So try to have a futuristic mindset and then do that backcasting or, or, or moonshot exercise to get there. Um, and so it is a, it's a process of creating that future. Don't let it be an exogenous variable, something that you have no control over because then we descend into apathy and just pray that someone will take care of it or that the future comes in a better form. Whereas the only reason it may be a bad future is our own actions. So we cannot relinquish our responsibility collectively and individually as humans. Yo, do, Professor Dr. Johan Rockström um, has done the planetary boundaries uh, and, and the safe operating space of the planetary boundaries. He just barely came out with a book this week, matter of fact, uh, two days ago, called Breaking Boundaries. He'll also have a Netflix uh, on that. I want, I want to know, <clears throat> he's also part of the UN advisor or also an advocate in some form, consultant in many different ways, not only for the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, but along with planetary boundaries thinking, donut economics, the, the new Green Deal, and those things, how, how do those different models uh, fit into um, resilience frontiers, but also in, into the, the UN system? How are they being used with circular economy? So many people are hearing these different models, these different things out there, and they're like, is that just for the EU? Is that for the whole globe? How do we understand it? How is it being applied? Does circular economy uh, compete with planetary boundaries? Does Donut economics compete with circular economy, things like that. And I kind of want to know how, how do those fit into what you just said, specifically planetary boundaries with, with resilience, but then maybe even the bigger picture, how is just the layperson supposed to understand all that confusion now? Is that competing with the UN or is that in line? No, I'm so glad you mentioned this because I see it as a continuum. Um, perhaps the... The, the, start, the starting point was the limits to growth report by the Club of Rome. And uh, we still haven't shifted that paradigm, even with, with, the, with the notions you, you mentioned, because the idea there was there are limited resources, so let's reduce our consumption, but still behave irrationally while reducing the consumption. You can just do less of the bad stuff <laughs> because you'll end up with a limit. Of course, it didn't take in any in, into account any technological evolution or any of that. And so the world did not end in 2000 as predicted. Then you got your Androxstrom's planetary boundaries. So, hey guys, there's another limit here. Don't go beyond it, reduce your consumption, you know, improve some of the stuff, but the basic paradigm is there. You, you keep that system that keeps producing all these inequities and whatever. Um, then you got the donut economics. Yes, you have the boundaries, but there's a minimum inside too. So don't go below that because that's detrimental to, um, to people as well. And um, I think we're going a step ahead of that with Resilience Front. You're saying that these boundaries, many of them are a function of our actions. So don't treat them as exogenous. Don't pretend they are there as a given because we can change them. I mean, many people... Um, Look at, okay, over, uh, overpopulation, population density. Um, so people are the problem because people are doing bad things to the environment. So maybe if you reduce the number of people doing bad things, then the environment will be better rather than get the people to do good things. Hence, they won't be a problem. But one of the, the main essences of that desirable future we're seeing is for each human to put into nature more than they're taking away from it then that gets you thinking very differently about population growth. Then, hey, yeah, maybe we can accommodate a bit more people so they can do more good stuff for nature. And you'd say, yeah, but you, know, you can't increase the population ad nauseum. Maybe you know, we're 7 billion, you can become 10 or 15, but do you really think the earth can take 
more than that, even if they're doing good stuff for nature. Well, look at this. If the world was to live at the population density of New York City, the whole 7 billion people would fit into the state of Texas. So I believe that if each person was to behave responsibly and sustainably, the world can accommodate a lot more people. And those boundaries we're talking about are movable. So that's the essence of resilience frontiers. The planetary boundaries are a function of our actions. They're not givens. Um, they are givens within the constraints of our current paradigm. But if we start thinking more intelligently, then you'll see that we determine those boundaries by our actions, by technological evolution, and ensuring that the technological evolution is directed in a way that enhances our sustainability and um, our capacity to remain um, in, in a hospitable environment. And so that, that's basically it, that um, please do not imagine that the future is imposed on us from another planet, or the limits are imposed on us through physical uh, necessity or, or, or givens from, uh, from biology or from physics. We're, we're nowhere near that. The, the limits we're seeing now are mostly due to things that we have done and constraints that we have created. Now, fortunately, we've only been messing up for two centuries. And you mentioned Hindu. The reason she was there was for us to benefit um, from the wisdom of indigenous peoples and modernize towards indigenous thought, which, which you know, turns upside down the notion that you know, indigenous peoples are, are, are you know, just there so we can protect them and their suffering and whatever. Yes, all that is correct. But they've managed to maintain their world and their natural support system over centuries. We've just been doing what we're doing for 200 years or so, and we've already messed up, so it's not working. And so we need uh, the values, the, the worldviews, not just about the practices and the knowledge, that's ancillary. But you will note that indigenous cultures that have never talked to each other, some in you know, the Inuit, uh, in the polar region, the Ch Chadian indigenous people, the Japanese, the uh, Latin Americans everywhere, they've all come to that similar principle that any action you take has to be assessed for benefits over seven generations to come. And for me, that's mind blowing that they all came to the same conclusion separately. And that destroys that whole cost benefit analysis discount rate story. So that's the value we get there. They've managed to retain sustainability by really applying intergenerational equity. And we have a lot of stories from, from today's world with indigenous communities where extreme events happen and there were proposals for quick fixes that even though they would immediately solve their problems, they would have uh, detrimental effects on future generations and they would refuse adamantly and this would have caused clashes with local communities and others. And so there's a lot to learn from conventional wisdom. There's very little to learn from people who have been doing activities for two centuries that have led us on this uh, downward spiral. So looking back, at our experience to try to derive guidance for the future is the worst thing we can do. But to think afresh, to visualize that future world that we want, do not assume constraints that are not there except because of where we have put ourselves in and benefit from the people who really know, mostly the indigenous peoples for now. And whoever is, is intelligent enough like yourself to think of that different world in the future that does not necessarily need to evolve incrementally from today's world without disrupting systems. And I think it's doable and it's actually doable without massive disruption or massive investment. I mean, if you look at the pathways, it's very small tweaks, but that have to happen synchronously across all pathways that can lead us into that uh, wonderful new world that we're aspiring to. I couldn't say it any better. And thank you for making that so understandable. Um, I, I believe that that is a big enough picture for something that's still evolving, developing more. Uh, I mean, we have a while till 2030, but we're actually have started and doing many steps towards there. Um, in COP25 in Madrid last year, the wonderful Resilience Lab Pavilion was there. Many wonderful talks. Uh, people who were in Sondo, Korea were there. 
uh, very successful, beautiful um, event and time with uh, also more momentum, more people awareness, understanding how they can participate, that they have a seat at the table, that they're part of this as well. And um, that's more and more over the years that I see that something that the UN in general, let's give everybody a seat at the table. Let's give them a voice. Let's have them be a part of this journey for transformation and change. We need everyone. And so I, I really, really love that. Unless there's anything else that you want to, that we left out on Resilience Frontiers, I think we'll move into a couple other topics before we, we wrap up today. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So the UNFCCC will be hosting and taking care of the COP26 in Glasgow, which is, uh, how, if I understand it correctly, is kind of co with Italy as a kind of a pre-COP and then the United Kingdom, and which is a wonderful event because of the pandemic and things. Do you, do you believe by the time the COP comes around, we will have the, the availability for people to travel? Is it going to be a hybrid event? What can you already tease and tell us about that? And what can we expect? Why would this event be pivotal coming out of a pandemic or out of the experiences we've had as well? Well, uh, the expectation now is that um, it will be a physical event, at least for the negotiations. We've we're still far from being able to replicate the functionality of in-person in-person negotiations with huddles and corridor talks and you know coffee shop engagement etc on the virtual world it's not that easy and the expectation is that we would have um, physical negotiations in glasgow with the appropriate um, you know health measures and social distancing etc um, but having said that, I think we, we, we're on an irreversible path where online engagement is here to stay. And so the idea is that it would, um, I mean, I, I characterize it as the largest COP in history. So we'd open um, the possibility for participation to many thousands of people through also uh, virtual participation. Um, and so for those who cannot justify uh, the emissions to come to Glasgow to present at a side event or to participate in the resilience lab that you mentioned, we would make sure that we have the capacity for full engagement through online means. So um, the question is where to to draw that threshold. You know how much would be would be virtual, how much would be physical, and um, and that will be mostly a function of the of the global health situation at the time. But uh, for now, the expectation is that there definitely will be a, a physical component, including with the presence of heads of state um, at the outset. And there definitely will be a virtual component as well. Uh, the ratio is still to be, to be decided. Everyone is hopeful that uh, by then, um, we'll be closer to having more of physical engagement than not, unless something happens along the way. The trajectory is good. The vaccinations are proceeding. Um, and um, and uh, if that happens, then it will be a major positive uh, signal because I think no big physical conferences are taking place before that. So this would be the first huge one. And um, and if it takes place, I think it will be uh, it it will be really good for morale and for us finally getting on track to to moving the discourse forward and benefiting now from all the experience we've gathered in virtual work to augment our, 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 our in-person engagement with, with this new uh, space that we've created and would benefit from. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of people thinking of now, how can we reinvent the way that countries engage together to, to reach decisions, um, taking full advantage of uh, both virtual and physical means? What, what, what does that paradigm shift entail? So yeah, that, that's where we are at the moment, but there's still time and, and hopefully we'll move in a positive direction. Um, that's really my hope. And um, the COP25 didn't really have the, the results that we wanted, but as far as the resilience lab and some of the other wonderful um, objectives and, and uh, new agendas that came out was, it was a really 
great, great meeting. Uh, it was worth it. Um, it. It was also unbelievable how quickly it was pulled together from going from uh, Brazil to Chile to from Chile saying uh, having issues to go to Madrid and having it all pull off and, and work, which was, was absolutely amazing. I'm sure you will amaze us again. Uh, the, the UNF Triple C will amaze us again with what coming for Glasgow and uh, we'll hope for the best that our, our world can get back in alignment. Right now, the, the next big event that I know of is the World Economic Forum in Singapore. They moved their annual meeting from Davos to um, uh, Luzern Bergenstock for a while and then said, no, we're gonna go to Singapore and it's still kind of on hold for that for August because they're, they're unsure about uh, the rules or restrictions, uh, health conditions. So it, it would be nice to have a big event, one specifically around the climate and uh, moving forward and that uh, being in Glasgow is our first event coming out of this to, to get back together and, and to have it be hybrid as well. There's something else that actually really kind of started emerge in 2020, and that is the UN Food System Summit. So really big, um, Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, uh, producing the uh, kind of pushing this agenda forward on the UN Food System Summit, and uh, fabulous. We'll have a physical event in June as the kind of the pre Food System Summit in. Rome at the UNFAO and then in Italy. And then uh, we'll go to New York um, in September, depending on how that looks as well, if that will be a big physical or hybrid event as well, that could turn out to be a still up in the air as far as everything we've heard. You guys are involved in that as well. Um, good. Good colleagues, not only David Navarro, Martin Frick, who's also part of the Secretariat and, and has been for a long time, has moved over to that position. Um, uh, what can you tell us about the UN Food System Summit, your involvement, and, and why it's such a pinnacle, super coming together for the world? Um, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, we haven't had a sort of one of those mega events in the UN uh, for a while. You remember we had the, uh, the Women's Summit in Beijing, we had the, uh, the Durban um, uh, Summit, we had the, uh, the Population Summit, and it's been a while since one theme has emerged to, um, to, be, um, uh, to become that kind of a priority that, uh, that uh, necessitated that type of coalition um, or coalescence. Um, the, the thing um, is that um, with climate change and its impacts, um, food tends to be at the center of all these impacts. You know, food security, food insecurity, um, water impacts affect food, um, food insecurity affects health. So, so it's, it's connected to, to everything that we're talking about. And, um, and the types of decisions that we need have to be a bit beyond the usual. Um, why? Because we've reached that stage where, as we've been talking for a while about paradigm shifts, the, the nature of, um, of how our food production works today is one of those elemental factors that um, would need to be transformed in order for uh, that desirable future to materialize. Um, especially the way um, uh, the food industry is is totally based on monoculture, um, and and you know that that is uh, sort of a, 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 a very contrarian to uh, to sustainability, where diversity is key for plants to um, to thrive, and we've known that forever. The indigenous peoples know that the principles of permaculture. Are, are basically the, 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 the guarantors of a sustainable future. Um, but this is what we have now. We've got to using soil, not as a source of nutrition, but just as a medium, uh, a physical medium in which you place plants and all the nutrition comes from somewhere else. And um, of course you have problems with pests. So you try to address that. Eventually you lose the topsoil. 
and um, and and the natural um, carrying capacity of the earth keeps being reduced as a result. So the transformation is interesting because the reason why you have these massive large scale uh, monoculture um, establishments is that it is easy to use agricultural mechanization when everything is planted with one crop. But now with, with AI and automation and uh, IoT, et cetera, maybe um, people can still continue making money but doing things the right way. And so, yes, you can plant, um, um, you know, um, uh, corn, beans, and squash together, which, which comes from uh, indigenous communities in, in the Americas, um, and have the machines go and just pick one of them because it can recognize them. Um, and the idea here is that when you combine the right uh, species together, then they help each other without human intervention. That's how forests work. You don't see a forest ranger going in and you know planting the seeds or watering the trees or whatever. They sustain each other, um, and and you'll never see the same species planted next to each other because that's not how nature works. Uh, it thrives on diversity. They protect each other against uh, against pests and they nurture each other. You know the output of one serves as input to another. So eventually, and these are the basics of regenerative uh, agriculture, and we have to move in that direction. So I'm hopeful um, that, and actually we're, we're very heavily involved. We are co-leading one of, um, of the action areas um, under resilience. And um, I'm hoping that uh, we do not go back to plugging the holes, but we see when we talk about systems, it's not about retaining today's systems as we move into the future and find how to make them better, but you can actually disrupt the systems because Today's food systems have certain ideas of what its components are. They have to have transport, for example. Maybe in the future you don't need that because you'll be surrounded by the food you need. There are no food deserts. You're within 100 uh, uh, or 1,000 feet from wherever you need to be, whenever the food needs to be. And so I think the, the essence of that and what we will try to bring in is also rethinking the systems and trying to produce um, uh, a world with regenerative food production, because that would satisfy several objectives. One is, is that um, um, process of uh, global recovery, the Earth's recovery, not, not COVID now, but it has a benefit to ecosystems and the carrying capacity of the Earth, but also to humans as we start producing um, food through regenerative means, they will be far more accessible than they are now. You're seeing a seed of that today already with community gardens, with permaculture outfits inside urban areas. Um, Florida, uh, not Florida, Atlanta, Georgia has just um, um, enacted the, the largest food forest within a city in the US. And it's an amazing project. And it is in what was designated a, a food desert. So it was in a place where nothing was grown nearby. So if this starts um, uh, becoming common practice and we keep replicating the good examples, there's so many um, regenerative farms in the world, uh, they're small scale though. And of course the big money is in the large scale stuff. So if that gets transformed, um, then I think we can uh, get one step closer to that regenerative world that um, we want to get to. The problem now is, um, there's a lot of corporations that are defining regenerative in their own way because there's no sort of official mandated definition. So some of the claims uh, to be doing regenerative farming are not really the ones that uh, we would consider to be regenerative. So hopefully the summit can help with this type of thing. But I think most importantly, raising awareness of the practices that are totally win-win for, for everyone and giving, um, um, also exposure to new technologies, whether they exist or they're in the pipeline, that can actually enable large-scale food production through regenerative and sustainable practices. So that's why I'm seeing the Food Summit as a turning point. So it, it, instead of us, we deal with food from one perspective, FAO from another, you know, IFAD, WFP, everyone. Um, we needed that umbrella engagement so as to plant the seeds, no pun intended, of 
um, of that paradigm shift in food as we move forward. That's so important. I'm glad uh, you feel that re regenerative agriculture, re regenerative agroforestry uh, is a big topic. I mean, I, I've spoken on it just in the last, since the pandemic, uh, at least uh, 26 times. Uh, just had a podcast yesterday with Eric Tonsmeyer, who wrote the section in Project Drawdown and the Drawdown book and his own book, The Carbon Farming Solution, about perennials, regenerative farming, um, where he started out the book just talking about the, the, the IPC report, IPCC report about um, what's out there and what's going on with climate change and how important it is we just make these big shifts in, in our food systems. And like you, like you mentioned, there's five action tracks. Um, one of the tracks is, has a, a strong part of resilience in it. I guess that's the one you guys are definitely involved in. And I hope to <clears throat> that there will be a, a not just the UN Food System Summit, but that also the, the, the COP26 in Glasgow will have an aspect where we're actually talking about food and maybe bringing some more results of the UN Food System Summit there. And, and that, that we really disseminate those new wisdoms and learnings. I, I've been getting updates and I'm doing a couple of the food system dialogues from, from David Nabarro, Nabarro and uh, really learning and seeing how many innovations, how many changing things are emerging uh, around the world in this area that uh, are specifically within these guidelines of those action tracks and the heroes and the champions that they have working on this and doing this. It's really wonderful to see. Um, I only have five questions left for you. We're kind of getting close on, on, on the time. One of them could be actually a little bit longer. And so I, we, we might want to skip it. It's also one of a little bit more complexity. I don't know how positive it would be. Last time um, I heard you speak, you were really talking about uh, NDCs, which means nationally determined contributions, and that they're cornerstone of national pledges for climate ambition, and that you have just kind of been compiling and receiving new NDCs that uh, you've had to do a report on or a synopsis, I don't know how, a synthesis report on, uh, and that it will demonstrate a positive global transition towards a low carbon future that we aspire to. Um, this is always a difficult thing, NDCs, regardless, I guess, with the, the UN. And I, uh, I don't know if you want to give us an update on how that went, how the report and where we, where we stand, uh, uh, or if, if it's too much to go into, and then we'll go into the last four questions. No, I can go through that quickly. I mean, the the, um, the Paris Agreement, um, in contrast to the Kyoto Protocol, which had specific reduction commitments for groups of countries with numbers, et cetera, the Paris Agreement is different. It works through a pledge and review system. So it's left to each country to say what it wants to do. Then we aggregate this. And like I said, we have this global stock take every five years. We look at it and say, hey, guys, we're doing really well, keep doing what you're doing, or no, we're, we're really not doing well, please do better, then we, we hope for the next pledges to be better. And we have a mandate that no NDC will, 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 will be less ambitious than the one before, so no backtracking. And, um, and so the first synthesis, uh, this is actually the second one, um, was uh, for NDCs submitted till the end of the year, uh, end of 2020. And um, we did not get from all countries. We actually got from countries responsible for 30% of emissions. And for those countries, um, the, the reduction um, that is being reflected is, is not close to where we need to be. Um, and it's the same for those who didn't submit. So the, the old ones weren't, these aren't yet. Um, but it still lacked input from uh, huge countries, and that's uh, that's uh, that those will be included in the next uh, update, which will be out right before the COP. Um, 
Now, how, how do we measure ambition? The IPC told us that we need um, a 45% reduction from 2010 levels by 2030. And where we are now is at 0 0.5. So it's uh, an order of two orders of magnitude away. And um, it's the good news that it's heartening that a lot of countries have um, volunteered or pledged um, a net zero um, world for them in 2050 um, through different pathways. So along the way, we also need to see where they will be in 2030 to see how feasible it will be to reach net zero in 2050. Um, we are also heartened by the fact that technology is moving faster than expected. So if you look at the IEA um, estimates, they've always been conservative compared to what happened in progress in renewables and in the price per kilowatt hour. And so this is happening. Technology is moving faster than we think it will. And so it might um, pull ambition up in ways that we can't see with a linear extrapolation in, in our heads. So um, I think the numbers will be much better by the end of the year. Um, officially, we were supposed to um, make a determination on ambition in 2023. But like I said, because of the science drive and as a result, the, 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 the activism that took place, um, whether from Fridays for Future or Extinction Rebellion or others, we've seen a lot more interest in seeing that ambition be reflected earlier rather than later. And in Madrid, we saw a, a very um, uh, vocal, um, very vocal interventions from civil society because of the lack of that signal. Even though it's not a negotiating item, it is about countries pledging uh, better action. And so um, I'm really hopeful, especially with, uh, with what we've seen from the US since the beginning of the year, that by the time we get to Glasgow, we'll have um, much better figures. But um, if we don't, I think it will be a really bad message to the world that, um, that uh, more needs to be done and some transformational thinking needs to take place. And um, I think be better awareness of the consequences we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving us that update. And um, even though kind of gloomy, uh, definitely with the results. Um, <clears throat> the last four questions I have moving on to a more positive note. Um, one is, is the hardest question I'm going to ask you today, even though you've addressed some pretty hard topics, and it's the burning question, WTF. And no, it's not the swear word. It's uh, what's the futures? And I really want to know from you um, and, and what your hope and, and, and ambitions and what you would like to see. You don't need to give me the two diplomatic or the two UN stance, but in your vision, What's the futures? Where are we going? What's the plan? Uh, what what do we have to be hopeful for um, to look at that uh, seventh generation horizon, so to say? Um, can, can you answer that for me? Yeah, from a climate change perspective, I think the, 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 the future is very likely one that will be quite positive. Um, because if we do not take action um, as we anticipate should be taken, we will get into the frog in the boiling water sooner rather than later, because we are seeing increases in visible impacts of climate change. So in no time, you start seeing hurricanes in places that have not experienced it before, more frequent, more intense, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, that should trigger um, an acceleration. See, the good news is the direction is there. We're moving towards a shift to, to renewable energies. The, the transport industry is there. I mean, they, they've, put, uh, uh, they've put timelines, cities are, have, have committed. So um, the problem we have is time. It's not direction. I think we're, we're, direction is set. It's irreversible. It's how fast we can get there. So anything that will accelerate will be good. Um, the fact that the Paris Agreement is a voluntary pledging system um, does not really inject that time element. So we need a bottom-up um, uh, push as well from civil society, from science, from R&D, 
to accelerate uh, at a higher rate. So I think that's going to happen because um, everyone is vigilant now, everyone is watching. And uh, once that happens, once you've solved the climate change problem, it links to so many other things in the SDGs and to ecosystems and to food and to water. So I think the, um, the, there'll be a lot of entry points for helping us move to that desirable world through the climate change lens. I mean, it's like I said in, at the beginning, it's a wicked problem, partly not just because of the multiple players or the uncertainty, but also because it links to everything in our lives. You move something here, everything else gets affected in other ways, then you have a whole group of interest uh, groups and economic implications, etc. And so I think we will get to that sweet spot where everyone is happy and, um, and business is able to contribute as they should and to, um, uh, to make that transformation into that new techno-economic paradigm where new jobs will be created for these new industries and um, a new level of economic activity will be pursued. So we're in a paradigm shifted world. Um, and we know that we have these waves of economic development that happen where old industries go and, and new industries come. So I, I think that's happening. My challenge is to make sure that as we fix the symptom, we're also fixing the ailment. And I'm hopeful that as we get to 20, uh, 2030, we fix the SDGs, we fix climate change, and we'll also manage to fix the foundation of everything else so that our relationship with nature is no longer one of, um, uh, of enmity <laughs> or, um, or just an extractive one. And, and um, in schools, they, they still... Uh, look at natural resources as you know, uh, factors of production rather than as um, uh, things that sustain us. And so um, this is my aspiration that we, we change the, the worldview and the mindset towards um, engaging with nature in a regenerative and more friendly way. It's not uh, our adversary and not our enemy and not just something there to be pillaged, uh, but it's a totally different type of, uh, of resource. I love that. I also believe that we, we're, we're in the right direction. It's just that time factor as well. Uh, one thing that humanity's always been really bad at is judging the exponential function. And I believe, you know, anyone who knows how that works at first on the exponential function, it seems like we're just going flat. We're at the same line. And then that growth, that, that hockey stick really occurs as we reach critical mass and things happen. I think we're, <clears throat> We'll be surprised that we start to implement more and more of those things. And, and uh, I've seen a lot of people wake up since the pandemic. I've uh, been busier than ever. It's all around environmentalism. It's all around the climate. It's all around uh, sustainable innovations for purpose and really talking about these big existential problems that we have and how, how we can resolve them. The last three questions I have are, are for my listeners. Um, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Seek out regenerative products. Make sure that you vote with your money. It's not just about putting out the message and continuing with our lifestyle, but make sure that your lifestyle reflects the values that we're talking about. And so whether it's a daily decision of walking versus using transport or public transport, or whether it is buying a product from the supermarket, please um, take the time to look at the origin of everything. Make sure it has not contributed to something unsustainable or to enhancing inequities. Uh, there's a lot of labels that will, uh, will give you that information. And, um, and with that, I think uh, the seed for transformation will be, will be put into effect. What should young innovators uh, looking, and I, I get this question a lot, um, uh, people, the youth in general, I wanna be in the UN, I wanna go do an internship, I wanna be there. But what should young people, young innovators, and even those advancing in their life be in your field be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make real impact 
for the world. Join the UN, do an internship. You know, what, what are some of your suggestions? Mm. Well, it depends on their passion. I mean, I'm seeing now, uh, and I'm collecting a lot of what they call bright lights for, for Resilience Frontiers, which are um, existing initiatives that are either already living in that future we're aspiring to. So they're conducting their business and producing things that are already compatible with, with that desirable future or are doing things that can help with the transformation. And predominantly, the people who have started these, uh, these startups uh, have been youth people right out of college, I'm, I'm seeing an amazing drive and, um, and passion for not just solving the climate change problem, but, uh, but sustainability in general. And a lot of the greatest ideas are coming from young people. And uh, a lot of the new companies that are doing this are coming from young people. So if, if that's the passion, please pursue it, noting that uh, it's not risky. The world is moving in that direction. I think that could be a built-in um, fear that, hey, you know, no one's doing this. Should we really use AI to, to conduct risk assessments for poor farmers and whatever? Yes, you should, because that's the direction. So once you know that, um, you, you would realize that, uh, that uh, it's better to be one of the first movers um, than to, to come in later. If the passion is to, to work in, in policy, then certainly the UN needs uh, more youth and needs fresh thinking. So we'd be very happy to, I mean, we do host internships. We have also fellowships, but uh, jobs, I mean, our entry level starts with uh, positions that require two years of experience. And um, for anyone with a passion for a future regenerative world, um, uh, we really need this type of thinking in the UN across the board, not just in my organization, but everywhere. Um, and and the, the, the idea is to have that vision, that storyline in one's head of where we want to be when, 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 uh, when we grow up. Is, is this the world uh, that you want? So are we pursuing um, just um, individual affluence and to have a great life? Or are you also aspiring to live in a place where uh, everything is sustainable and you've prepared it in a way that would be um, would be good for future generations. So uh, the UN is a great place to, to push these ideas forward. Certainly welcome. Otherwise, uh, uh, those more scientifically and technically inclined should do their own startups and, and, and create the seeds for, um, for that future. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? That, uh, that most of the constraints that we think are given uh, are movable and do not need to be there. So all these things um, from you can't do this because the rule says so, well, there's always a channel to change the rule if, if, if you advocate enough or you can't do this because it's never been done before. Well, so what? It's always the first time. So not to be constrained by any conventional wisdom that can hold you back. So when one is new, you want to conform. You want to not break rules. You want to not break molds. You, you want to come into the, the in crowd and, and not seen as being disruptive. But then I think what I know now is um, that one has to speak up and act in order to change things that even though the, the majority might be seeing as normal, you can see that they're leading you to a wrong place. And I'm, I'm not just talking about fixing the world, I'm talking about even little things, you know, the rules say this, and, and you find that the rule is unethical or inequitable, um, then one has to see, okay, how do we change the rule? Let's go, let's discuss it, let's have a committee, whatever. So this is the thing that I know now that I didn't know then. I just thought that if people say it's not allowed, then it's not allowed. What can I do? <laughs> I'm glad you said that. So I'm going to have Dr. Bertrand Picard on the show um, in a couple of days. And he's really someone who doesn't does things that others don't know are not impossible. And, you know, kind of this explorer mentality. And that's really the thing. If, if, uh, if, if, if you take that stance, it really, uh, you'll be surprised. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. Yusuf, thank you for letting us inside of your ideas. I really appreciate your time today on, on your day off to sacrifice for us to let us uh, know your wisdoms. 
It's been a sheer pleasure and we could talk forever. We'll see each other very soon. I, I just thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure and happy to, to talk with you anytime. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.